we went for almost seven, eight days to this uh, Indian astronomical observatory. And uh, the skies there were absolutely phenomenal. I think it was extremely dark and uh, quite almost nine hours to travel just 275 kilometers from Leh. And um, the ground was literally lit with just light from the Milky Way. And uh, I have never seen like, and uh, even ever since, I have never seen skies like that. This is Johan Nishant. He is an astronomy and photography enthusiast and also an IT architect by profession. And in my view, a great example of someone who practices several passions in the field of art, science and engineering. I accidentally came across his work during a photography competition several years ago. But the quality of his work in astrophotography left, left me inspired. In this episode, we explore the world of photography, astronomy, photo micrography through ideas in science. I want to start by exploring one of my favorite ideas, uh, the human vision and how our brain perceives electromagnetic waves or light particles mm -hmm. for now, or, or light okay. in general. Uh, to me, this is as fascinating as the overwhelming scale of the universe. Uh, so mm -hmm. before we dive into photography, I'm curious to know if you think about such ideas. Uh, do you contemplate about what we see every day? Do you think uh, about the colors as simply being electromagnetic waves with different energies? Yeah, I think uh, this is a very, very uh, beautiful concept, uh, the seeing part. And uh, for me particularly, like, uh, uh, it was a bit uh, interesting, like, uh, when I was doing, when I started photography uh, many years ago, and uh, I think uh, I, I did a bit of street photography uh, many years ago as well. And uh, it, during that process, uh, this really, uh, this concept uh, challenged me a lot. Uh, for example, uh, when you look when I mean, you're when you're seeing something right seeing is something we have been doing uh, since we were born it's something we have been trained to do in many ways we have been uh, sort of uh, you know conditioned in many ways to know what is right what is wrong what looks good what looks bad and uh, uh, at least when i was uh, doing photography i read this really interesting book uh, it was called the art of seeing and uh, initially it covered all the the physical concepts as well like even the science behind it how the eye sees and uh, how it understands and how it's converted into like uh, the actual you know thought processes and uh, uh, yeah it, it actual things happening in your brain uh, but then it went uh, moved on to even more deeper things like uh, uh, what is good like what is bad what looks good what looks bad and uh, those were uh, really interesting and that challenged me a lot uh, at least when I was doing street photography and uh, even today when uh, when I'm just taking uh, more <laughs> not so much into street photography but even my regular photos I take it really uh, puts a lot of thought into my mind like uh, uh, you know like what looks good what looks bad and also to uh, it's my personal view it should, it should not i think everybody has their own perspective of like uh, what looks good and what looks bad and uh, it's uh, a very interesting concept and uh, especially in astronomy that uh, is taken to a, a sort of a, a one notch higher like uh, when you're looking at visual astronomy especially like uh, what you're looking through in many situations can be photons which are the uh, super, super old, have traveled for millions of years, maybe, or the, and uh, that, again, uh, really, is, uh, <laughs> it expands my thoughts, at least, uh, and it gives me a lot of goosebumps when I, even once you actually uh, ponder about what you're doing, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely an interesting thing. It make, made me thought, uh, think a lot about it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think it's one one of the most fascinating ideas and uh, fields of study. Uh, do you also think there's a bias, like you talked about uh, initially, which is good, which photo is good, which is bad, or how to take a good 
for talk. Uh, so do you think we've, there's a bias and it's uh, difficult to sometimes uh, go against it? Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, I mean, uh, at least it's sort of like a, a good majority of people uh, agree to think that certain things look beautiful and uh, I guess that's where this sort of uh, bias comes in a way uh, sort of this collective uh, you collectively think that something is good or something is bad and it's sort of widespread and uh, uh, I strongly believe there is this bias and uh, oftentimes uh, I feel that uh, I too have a bias when what looks good what looks bad and and I, uh, yeah, I think it's it's there for a reason, maybe like, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a very interesting concept uh, as well. And uh, yeah, it's it's hard to get away from it. And uh, I think you can produce some really incredible work. Um, I, I mean. I guess it will be good to know the bias and uh, actively know why there is a bias. Like, for example, if you look at photography, let's take a simple thing like the rule of thirds, right? Uh, you have this uh, simple rule and you try to place your uh, subject or your most interesting part of your photo in one of these uh, four intersection points, right? In your uh, picture. And uh, uh, I mean, I think it becomes really good when uh, you know this rule, you know that pictures tend to look a bit better when you have the subject in these four intersection points, but you actively try uh, not just for the sake of breaking the rule, breaking the rule, but you know that maybe it looks even better without the rule in this particular case. And uh, so maybe that would be interesting as well. Like, uh, knowing that there are biases, knowing that there are certain rules and ways to do things and uh, what people like and maybe actively choosing not to do it, not for the sake of it, but for the sake of what you think is better maybe for that particular situation. So yeah, it's a very interesting concept. Yeah, yeah the rules of third and the composition in general is, uh, quite like for me, it's OCD almost. Uh, after going through many pictures, <laughs> yeah. it's uh, it becomes like a hard rule. But yeah, I like yep. that you talk about how you can be aware of it and try to challenge it in a way. That's interesting. Yeah. Analogous to our vision, cameras process light to produce a visual medium of information. And today we find cameras everywhere. There's even a pair on the Voyager 1 spacecraft which last time I checked was a little over 22 billion kilometers from the Earth. Uh, can you talk about your early encounter with this technology we call camera? You're talking about the normal camera, just the normal camera here? Or... Yeah, your first camera and how you were first yeah. introduced to a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I was a bit uh, lucky in a way. My grandfather was... Uh, quite into photography. Uh, he uh, was into, he, he did an automobile practice uh, in Tamil Nadu in uh, Madurai. And, uh, but he was really, really into photography. And I think he had uh, quite a lot of cameras uh, initially when uh, it was not a very common thing as well. Uh, especially I remember he had one of the first digital cameras I think in uh, uh, Madurai or even Tamil Nadu at that time. And, uh, but I think uh, he, it changed for me when uh, he gave me one of his old cameras. I think it was a Canon 350D. And this was sometime in uh, 2006, I think. And uh, uh, that's when uh, it, it changed a lot for me when I had this uh, a digital SLR. And um, it really made me at least experiment a lot with it. Uh, try different things, explore uh, this in extremely beautiful concept of exposure, uh, changing the shutter speed, aperture, ISO, and seeing how that uh, really affected things. 
and i still have that camera today and it still <laughs> works in some degree and uh, it's uh, yeah so that really kicked it off for me uh, i would say it was uh, that camera which did a, i took a huge number of photos with that and uh, yeah it's, uh, that was the start for me that uh, camera the 350d nice uh, so do you still shoot on canon or do you experiment yeah uh, in when i'm shooting digital pictures uh, the primary thing is still canon and uh, even for my astrophotography uh, for a long time it was uh, canon and but it's a heavily modified uh, canon uh, camera and uh, but when i'm shooting film uh, which is something i've been doing a lot uh, more of lately uh, it's uh, right now i'm using a minolta uh, srt 101 Uh, if i'm not wrong it was made in the 63 if i'm not wrong 1963 but it's a really nice camera it's super good and uh, it's really robust uh, the one i have is has had a lot of faults before i got it so it looks kind of beat up but uh, i really like it and uh, i like the photos uh, it helps me take that's nice uh, yeah. yeah sorry you were saying Yeah, that's uh, it, so. It's uh, Canon for digital and uh, quite a different type of cameras for film. Uh, the the cameras on the Voyager spacecraft are uh, somewhere close to the one you mentioned, so quite old and seventies te- technology. Uh, yeah. It has an interesting method for resetting the photoelectric pair. I'm not sure if you are mm-hmm. if you've come across that, but it helps. No. it helps to basically shoot multiple images where one side of the photoelectric plate are neutralized with electrons uh, through a cathode mm-hmm. ray tube um, mm-hmm. so is there a fascination with the technology aspect of the camera or do you just see it as a tool uh there was a part of my life uh, for example when i was quite involved with astrophotography and before i had uh, sort of got my astro photography camera the heavily modified canon uh, so when it comes to astronomy uh, you cannot uh, i mean the dslrs the normal regular canon dslrs or nikon or sony whatever the dslrs we use are not optimized for astrophotography uh, there are a lot of uh, for example nebulae and even certain galaxies which uh, give out light in the h alpha part of the spectrum the very reddish sort of uh, side of the visual spectrum and uh, a lot of these uh, traditional consumer cameras we have today have uh, an inbuilt uh, ir infrared sensor which sort of blocks uh, infrared light because we don't want that normally in regular photo photos but a by product of that is uh, it also definitely blocks this h alpha part of the spectrum which uh, a lot of nebulae and galaxies sort of uh, emit and looks looks very very beautiful so i was really looking to get one of these cameras try to modify my camera otherwise but uh, i am not a electronic student i actually studied computer science and uh, i'm i mean i like taking apart things but i'm really not uh, super good with putting them back very nicely but uh, i had a, a small project to do because um, i was really interested in uh, these astro photography cameras but they were super super expensive especially uh, with the budget i had at that time uh, even now actually like with this uh, they, they're super super expensive but uh, the sensor in them right like so uh, at least previously a lot of astro- astronomy cameras were uh, ccd based uh not uh, so much like the cmos the kind of sensors we have today and uh, uh i was uh, one of the cameras which i wanted at least at that time was it was called sdig 8300m so this was the it was a camera company at least then it was known as santa barbara imaging group i think and uh, they made this really nice uh, ccd camera but uh, it was super expensive i think it was i think 3000 or something uh, at that time and uh, but the same sensor uh, the it all of those cameras used this Kodak 8300M uh, CCD chip 
uh, yeah, Kodak you, uh, used to make these really good CCD chips as well. Um, and, and this same chip was actually found in an L uh, uh, Olympus, I think it was an OMD5 or something. I forgot the exact model number. But this camera was retailing in um, eBay and things like that as a, it's super cheap. It was like uh, $200 or something like that uh, at that time. And uh, so I really thought uh, to maybe buy one of these uh, cameras and try to modify it in some way. But while I was doing that process and was reading up a lot about it, I actually got a really good deal on a heavily modified uh, Canon 5D uh, Mark II. And uh, this had a external cooler, for example, attached to it. And uh, it had this internal IR filter already removed. So it really, uh, my project didn't go on further. I focused more on actual pictures uh, from then onwards. But uh, yeah, so it's been uh, not a lot of uh, getting into the, uh, the technology, which drives it a lot. But uh, I'm, I'm aware of it in a way. And especially when it comes to astronomy, like uh, things like noise, uh, for example, this uh, thermal noise that you have uh, in each picture is uh, super important and ways to mitigate it also involve like this method of cooling and uh, other different technologies you can use. So yeah, it's always fascinating, but uh, not a, done a lot of, uh, you know, tech, I mean, the hardware things myself. Uh, you talked about uh, removing the IR filter uh, to ca capture or uh, be, uh, for the sensor to be sensitive to a H alpha spectrum, is it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, how, how much detail does it act, does it uh, you know produce compared to with and without an IR sensor? Yeah. You mentioned nebula. Uh, yeah. Is there a I lot of difference? A, yeah, it's a staggering difference yeah if you can uh, i can maybe sh you can see online as well there are like a lot of photos uh, of nebulae before even i have i used to do a lot of astronomy even before i had this camera with my normal uh, canon camera at that time and uh, it, it's a massive difference when you're imaging uh, uh, h alpha nebulae for example if you take uh, let's say the rosette nebula uh, this is a nebula which has like a pinkish hue and uh, a big portion of it is in the H alpha uh, radiation, I mean, part of the spectrum. And uh, when you image it with a normal 5D, it looks completely different, like a normal unmodified uh, Canon camera or a DSLR. But the moment I got my uh, camera modified and uh, I mean, I got this modified camera and I was able to image it again, it looked so much different. I would say it had like about 40%, maybe like a rough up, um, approximation of how much more uh, color it had. So it was, uh, yeah, pretty cool uh, difference. And uh, once you do that, you can never go back. So it's, uh, it's something which, uh, yeah, you definitely need going forward. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, that's really interesting. Um... And often with uh, photography, the journey leading to the photo, uh, photograph is more enjoyable than taking the photograph itself. Especially, yeah. uh, I've noticed this with landscape photography. Uh, and sometimes it's about capturing a rare moment or a mm -hmm. bird or an animal. Uh, and for some people, it's more about the technical aspects of photography. Uh, mm -hmm. But what is photography to you? Yeah, this is a, I mean, a, it's a hard question. Like, uh, I think photography is a great way to experience the world we live in and share it with others. Uh, and not just the world, the universe yeah, in many ways. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a really fantastic way to share what you feel and what you are experiencing at that same time. I can think of like numerous times where uh, I've been in, in these really uh, very beautiful places. Uh, like one of them is was in uh, this place called Hanle in Ladakh. Uh, this was uh, near the Indian Astronomical Observatory which was about uh, 4,500 meters above sea level. 
and uh, being in these extremely spectacular places and uh, i mean you can just take in this beauty all yourself but uh, taking a picture there and showing someone else and uh, sort of getting them in a way into that same place as well or even inspiring them to go there the next time or uh, i think that's a very powerful thing which photography is and for me i like both sides of it i really love the you know bringing people there aspect and the meaningful aspect of it as well so for example like photos like especially street photography can have you can have a lot of meaning in the photos and uh, convey thoughts and emotions and things like that but i definitely love the technical side of it as well, uh, as well like especially astrophotography and photo micrography you need to invest a lot of time and effort into uh, ensuring you have this uh, first of all the equipment and uh, also the understanding to process the images and finally produce something which is even uh, worthy to share it's uh, i love that process i love getting into the details and uh, planning and uh, you know uh, if uh, anyone has done astrophotography especially deep sky astrophotography uh, you would probably realize how many things can go wrong in the night like so many things especially uh, for example when i was uh, imaging in india like it's uh, you usually go to very dark places so you need to have a, a completely portable kit like a a lot of gear and uh, especially when you're in the middle of like being in places which is pitch dark and uh, you can you can't see anything except the stars above and uh, and that really really forces you to plan quite well ahead and uh, take a lot of uh, you know thought and process into it so yeah i think uh, i really love that part about photography as well it's a really really fascinating hobby which uh, at least to me was a good mix of uh, art and science uh, you have a lot of art involved but you have a good amount of science as well involved and technology as well so yeah yeah it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the social aspect and also the meaning uh, uh, aspect to photography yeah i think it it is a medium of information but it has a lot of potential to help people and bring them together so that's really beautiful um, when talking about colors as being just perce- uh, perceived uh, stimulus that are beautiful brain process uh, i like to use the graphical a graphical plot as an analogy uh, where one takes data that exists in reality in a way and classifies the information and associate them to different colors or shades of colors uh, i think a popular example is the map of covid uh, it's the same with our vision uh, different wavelengths of electromagnetic waves are associated with different stimulus or colors in our brains uh, it gets more interesting when you think about these associations and how the brain processes uh, sensory information from our eye Uh, like you can think is my red same as yours uh, i bring up i bring this up because you work with analog photography like you mentioned where you develop images using chemical processes uh, do you get to pick which colors associate to which wavelength in a way if that makes sense yeah that makes sense ha uh, huh, but it's a very interesting question and uh, specifically in analog photography uh this is something i've been doing for quite some time but um, the main part was uh, at least so far i've been focusing only on black and white uh, and analog photography and color was something i recently started experimenting in so this is about 2 months uh, or something 2 and a half months old this is uh, maybe 3 months uh, since i started shooting color pictures the reason for that is uh, black and white i live uh, in an apartment in sweden and uh, it's not a lot of space to sort of um, have a full dark room kind of setup and i do a lot of things in my kitchen for example at least i used to and uh, the color 
chemicals, right, which you use for color processing is um, a bit dangerous, quite dangerous to the body. Uh, I think uh, some, I think the fix, for example, uh, and the bleach, what we use can also cause cancer if it's uh, ingested in some way. So it was always uh, putting me off because I didn't really have this uh, lot of space, uh, like a specific area with a sink and some open area to let the gases out as well. But uh, after a long time, I found that I could possibly do it in my toilet. <laughs> and uh, my toilet had a quite a large window. And um, after a while, I was able to optimize that place for uh, doing color processing. So that's something I started recently. And it is such a big difference from black and white. Uh, black and white, as, as you rightly mentioned, is, is not something you, you don't have colors to think about. And especially how calibrated those colors need to be, how balanced, uh, because that's something I noticed a lot. Uh, so I had, uh, so you usually get the developing chemicals in a sort of all in powder form and you sort of, sort of, and or these concentrates and you sort of make a batch for like five liters uh, or even one liter with that. And uh, while I started this, you have to be super, super precise with mixing this, these different, uh, combinations of uh, uh, chemicals and they're quite a lot i think there were about nine bottles that you had to start with and uh, i had a graduated cylinder uh, this beaker basically with the i think the graduations were like at 50 milliliters uh, each graduation so not a very precise one and uh, i this is my as the first time i started the first batch of developing i've done I know, I didn't mix it, I guess, to the preciseness it required. It really said in the instructions that you have to be super precise. And once I got the final product, I realized that everything was sort of shifted to the blue side of things. And uh, I guess it's a really interesting thought, like uh, how, like you, you need to get your, at least developers, the the chemicals, the developing chemicals in a correctly calibrated and balanced uh, way for you to produce images which will look uniform. So for example, if you take a picture with camera A using film B, uh, one person does it in this specific area with this specific temperature, uh, that photo should ideally look similar to the same thing what uh, you take with camera A and B with another person. But uh, with just a few milliliters difference of this mixing chemical, the result is different. And uh, yeah, so it's a very interesting concept what you mentioned earlier as well, like uh, with the colors, what you see, like your, the red you see, is it the red another person sees? It's, uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you can clearly see that when you're doing, um, analog photography, especially when you're developing chemicals yourself, I guess. And, uh, <laughs> but it's really fun. Uh, that's something I would like to say, like, uh, especially that's another part of photography, which is like, I mean, normally photography, you get quite a deep into physics, I guess, if you're getting into the technology side of things, semiconductors and, uh, uh, you know, light and lenses and, you know, those kind of things. But uh, when you get into developing, you get more into the chemistry behind uh, that and uh, that is very interesting as well like that's some subject i always liked doing back in school and uh, especially mixing chemicals and uh, yeah, and when you know these chemicals are actually dangerous as well you add this level i mean this uh, thought of precaution and you i had a lot of gloves and i looked uh, something like out of breaking bad almost you know the my kids my toilet looked like it was a lot of uh, beakers and the different colors just flowing around it was quite beautiful so yeah so that uh, very interesting question but yeah yeah that's really fascinating i think the whole process is uh, often you know just skip because with uh, digital photography you just have a option of using i think srgb or different pro color profiles i'm guessing that yeah. is similar to the chemical process in a digital way yeah that's a very good way to, uh, to help. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So this is actually like it, your hands on, you're actually experiencing the science behind it, which is pretty cool. Yeah. 
uh, another uh, recent idea I came across uh, is the evolution process, process of seeing more colors or mm -hmm. how you could train your brain to be more conscious in a way about uncommon colors. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think this is really mind blowing because you can actually train your brain to learn uh, to see more colors in a way. Uh, so do you think your catalog of colors has grown uh, through all these years of photography? Are you more conscious about any new colors? Huh. Mm, to be really honest, this is something, I mean, I've heard of people who can see a little bit more into the, the both the sides of the visual spectrum, um, a little bit more to the, you know, the ultraviolet side of things or the infrared side of things. But uh, me particularly, no, I wouldn't say, I mean, at least it's not something I've consciously observed. Um, I don't see any indication that uh, I could see more colors uh, from the start of when I started doing this. Colors is something I really enjoy and I really appreciate the beauty of whatever color, but uh, seeing more than what I used to see before, maybe I definitely pay attention to more beautiful things and beautiful colors in my perspective, but uh, I don't think it's more than this, uh, what is this, 350 to 700 nanometers? That's what we normally can see. So, uh, yeah. Yeah it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a difficult question because there's no reference or no way to judge or compare. Yeah. Uh, but it was a really interesting idea. I thought uh, you might have uh, experienced something. Mm -hmm. I like uh, shooting in black and white uh, because somehow they bring out more detail. Uh, going back a bit to physics sides of uh, black and white, uh, they are simply, for example, black is simply the absence of light or energy. Uh, but most blacks we see every day is not pure black. And white is, as far as I know, is purely uh, perceived uh, color stimulated when one sees multiple wavelengths. Uh, but when do you consider shooting uh, something in black and white or editing a picture in black and white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I really appreciate uh, this black and white. I mean, I guess in certain situations, color can be distracting in a way, uh, but you got to really think about that, I guess, like uh, you got to really find situations where the color does not add any value or sort of degrade the value that you already have. And uh, yeah, I too agree that black and white uh, is can uh, at least make photo photos appear more detailed. And uh, at least if you're into post-processing as well, I've noticed that if it's in black and white, you can push the detail or contrast or uh, you know the shadows or the, the light those much more harsher than what you can do when you have color to think about so in that way it's definitely interesting and maybe pushes more emphasis on the subject maybe uh, for example in street photography when i used to do that a lot it was almost quite often that i used to make my photos black and white and uh, really push a lot of the details uh, quite a lot more. So yeah, in those situations, I really, I think it should be used uh, uh, with thought. You need to think that, as I mentioned before, like uh, will the color degrade the value? In those situations, maybe good to try black and white. And uh, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, what I think about it. Uh, you talked about astronomy uh, earlier. Uh, I, I want to explore uh, more into your journey uh, with astronomy. So how did you first encounter astronomy? Uh, what were your early yeah. curiosities with the night sky? And how did you transform yeah. those 
uh, experience into exploring deep space objects like galaxies, star clusters, and how do you build this passion in astronomy? Yeah, so it was, uh, I think, I never had, at least when I was growing up, a deep into in interest in astronomy or something like that. Uh, I really liked as I mentioned, photography for some time. And uh, I think it was about 2012 when I've been doing just normal photography for quite some time, but in a very, you know, not in a very serious or professional way. And, uh, but I, I think it was about 2012 when I was on the internet and uh, I saw this image of the Andromeda galaxy and uh, I didn't know anything about it. I thought it looked fantastic to me. And uh, I had assumed it was taken by something like a Hubble or some sort of uh, space telescope or some sort of observatory at least. And, uh, but as I was reading through the details, I realized that that image was actually taken by uh, amateur, an amateur astronomer and an amateur astrophotographer. So a person who does not do this full time is probably doing something else. And um, yeah, that fascinated me. Like that really pushed me like, oh man, is that even possible? And uh, I think for a year, I read up quite a lot. And uh, I mean, you definitely need a bit of, uh, you know, but, I mean, money to sort of get into this uh, hobby, especially if you want to do deep sky astrophotography. So I was trying to save up money. I was in college at that time as well. And uh, try to buy one of these telescopes and uh, but during that year when I was trying to save up I was just trying to suck in as much as information as possible and uh, I was really really fascinated the entire time and uh, I had a lot of theory based knowledge in that year and uh, I think uh, a year later I think it was I think 2013 or even 2014 or something uh, and I, I, I tried to do some sort of astrophotography as well uh, in that year with just my camera and my uh, lens, a normal uh, zoom lens and a normal tripod. Uh, I tried to take like a huge number of photos of maybe like very bright and big objects like uh, the Orion Nebula and uh, Andromeda Galaxy from Bangalore. And uh, But I was able to get some basic images and uh, without uh, tracking or anything like that. But I think it was 2014 when I actually got my telescope. That was a big game changer for me. Uh, that really opened up the universe in some way. I was able to photograph and also see a lot of interesting things. And uh, I used to travel to different parts of uh, Karnataka. Uh, where I used to live in Bangalore at the time. And uh, I used to go quite a lot to this uh, near Madhugiri, there was a wildlife sanctuary called Jayamangali Black Buck Reserve. And uh, so that was a very special place at that time. And uh, it was quite a flat land near uh, Madhugiri, near Tumkur, northwest of uh, Bangalore. And uh, at least at that time, it, was, it had very little light pollution. It was super, super dark. And... Uh, it was in the middle of a, a black box reserve. So you could actually hear a lot of these animals in the night and uh, it was really fascinating. And uh, so we used to do, I mean, uh, it was just me at the time and just doing astrophotography from there. And uh, I think it was 20th October, 2014, when I took my, that first picture, like, which I was really proud of, of uh, the Andromeda galaxy. And uh, this similar to how it was back in 2012, taken by another amateur astrophotographer. Yeah, so that was a really interesting time. And uh, since then, almost every new moon of the month, when it was clear, I used to, around the new moon time, travel to some part of Karnataka or even sometimes to Tamil Nadu uh, to dark places and um, try to photograph uh, yeah, these different objects. And uh, yeah, it was super, super nice. And uh, the peak, I think the best place I've ever been to was, uh, as I mentioned sometime earlier, this uh, place in Ladakh, uh, Hanle, 
uh, we went together with a, like it was sort of like a group of astrophotographers we went for almost 7 8 days to this uh, indian astronomical observatory and uh, the skies there were absolutely phenomenal i think it was extremely dark and uh, quite almost 9 hours to travel just 275 kilometers from leh and um, the ground was literally lit with just light from the milky way and uh, i have never seen like an uh, even ever since i have never seen skies like that so it was a bit uh, disappointing in one way because i think after that just photographing there and even just seeing objects in the sky there nothing can look the same like uh, you can be in a very dark place in karnataka but uh, the difference the altitude makes and also this very thin atmosphere and also this extremely dark because there's i think no light bulbs around for quite a few hundred kilometers so it was uh, a phenomenal place that uh, those eight days and uh, i was able to take one of my i think my most uh, the proud of work i am that was this uh, giant mosaic of uh, the orion constellation and it was a very very detailed image with uh, a lot of nebulosity and i spent i think three nights uh, for just that uh, uh, image and uh, yeah a lot of things surprisingly went really well in that trip and uh, yeah it was it was really really good yeah so since then it's been good i left uh, bangalore to move to sweden in september i think of 2017 and uh, since then i've been doing little bit of uh, even going to the north of sweden to do pictures of the aurora and that as well is a phenomenal thing and to see and also to photograph the uh, so yeah the astronomy journey has been really 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 good but uh, unfortunately in sweden it's uh, the city which i am in is called gothenburg and uh, it's on the west coast of sweden very very beautiful city but uh, it's quite cloudy and rainy <laughs> uh, throughout the year and uh, in the summer it's quite clear but it's so high uh, northern uh, in, in on earth that uh, the summers are quite bright so even at like 12 in the night it's uh, you can probably read something outside with this little bit of light and uh, there's no way you can do proper professional astro photography in uh, a summer like that so it's been at least my astro photography has been a bit uh, dwindling a bit in this uh, in sweden but uh, a lot of other things have been going quite nicely yeah uh, that's a really interesting story uh, i can i can definitely relate to your earlier fascination um, when i was at your presentation or workshop at bms uh, there was no way uh, i mean i was like this is not possible with a telescope and a dslr from the ground level because the pictures were so clear and it was i, I was confused if these were from space yeah. like you mentioned uh, so yeah. that's that's really fascinating yeah. uh, speaking about sweden and uh, your experience in the northern part of india uh, can you talk about some of the contrasts and uh, the possibilities that the northern hemisphere offers you talked about uh, the auroras are there any other uh, advantages yeah are you talking strictly to like astronomy or photography or is it like general or uh astronomy yeah i think i mean india is extremely good for astrophotography in my view the best part is uh, i mean there are a lot there is a lot of light pollution nowadays and uh, like especially if you live near a city it's getting super hard you need to go really a lot more further to find dark skies uh, that's not a big issue in sweden if you go just 15 kilometers from your city most cities it's quite dark outside and uh, but the biggest advantage of india i would say is the weather 
like uh, it's december now and uh, you can still go out in shorts and you can be outside in the night with just maybe your shorts or even just a small like a like a jeans or something you know you don't need a thick jacket you don't need uh, gloves and some hats and things like that and uh, the biggest difference for me in astronomy in sweden is though it's super cold in the winter and uh, it the cold and it can really slow you down uh, when you're doing astrophotography because you usually sit out in the open for long periods of time uh, while you image uh, the different things and uh, it can be really difficult in the cold and uh, you need a lot of motivation to really go out on these extremely cold days i still remember because usually at least in winter the coldest days are the clearest nights and i remember one time i was imaging jupiter with a really good uh, friend of mine and uh, it was minus 9 that night and uh, we stayed i think about 6 hours in the cold and it was in a open air observatory uh, the it's a sort of a dome which protects you a little bit from the wind but the cold comes in and uh, it was a big challenge like uh, i mean i i don't mind the cold that much but uh, it, it, well you're quite still you know doing much you know like at least if you're cycling or something you build up some body heat but if you're quite still in that temperature and for a long period of time it gets really really cold so i would say india has a lot of different advantages like that and uh, one great thing about also south india especially like if you're imaging in bangalore or uh, karnataka or even tamil nadu somewhere there uh, you can see quite as we're quite close to the equator you can see quite a lot of objects from the southern hemisphere southern skies as well so for example this uh, extremely beautiful globular cluster called omega centauri you cannot see it from well, northern skies and uh, you can see a lot of different uh, so being here in this quite close to the equator you have almost like the best of both worlds you can still see andromeda galaxy and a lot of the northern objects the northern galaxies like uh, uh, the sigar galaxy or m81 m82 but you can also see uh, some of the southern uh, beautiful beautiful things as well like carina nebula and uh, omega centauri and a lot of the different southern objects as well so being here i think you get a really good best of both worlds feeling but uh, in sweden it's so not uh, not high up and not i mean so north in the in the world that uh, it, you don't see at all a lot of the southern things uh, so it's a bit different but it's uh, very good as well you you see like for example a lot of the objects in the sky can be circumpolar so they never set for example like i think even andromeda galaxy is like uh, they can be many times where it never sets it can just keep going around the pole because the pole is almost 60 65 degrees above uh, um, the equator i mean above the horizon so both places have different specialities but uh, if you ask me i would i still prefer if you're doing deep sky astrophotography i prefer india any day like uh, yeah uh, that's, uh, that's that's really interesting i wasn't aware of the possibilities in the southern part of uh, india uh, yeah i agree the skies are uh, depending on where you live can be a can play a big role in uh, your uh, yeah your photographs uh, but uh, going back to sweden a bit uh, do you plan on visiting uh, the sweden solar system uh for the yeah. listeners and those who are not aware uh it's the largest scale model of the solar system uh the sun is represented by uh, ericsson globe at stockholm uh an arena with a capacity of 16000 people uh and it has an outer diameter of 71 meters and i think this is a beautiful way of representing the scale of our solar system Uh, have you come across it have you seen it yeah i saw i think a few i think it was 
mercury if i'm not wrong somewhere it was and but i've heard a lot about this and uh, no but i've never seen it in li- uh, like i've seen only one i think if i'm not remember if i don't remember exactly when but i remember mercury i think i saw it with one person but uh, i don't remember i mean i i have not done the whole thing it's something uh, still on my bucket list but uh, yeah i think uh, it can be really far away if i'm not wrong as well like uh, like neptune or something is already way up in the northern part of sweden so it's not something i think you do over a day or something yeah it's yeah. i think it's it probably takes two seasons um, depending on how the weather yeah. works out yeah uh, two recent events that sometimes still bothers me because i was unable to witness them is the 2019 transit of mercury and the pass of comet neowise uh, there are many rare such uh, transits and cosmic events like supernova explosions and near earth passing of comets and so on uh, but often out of reach for many uh, you know be it the average life span or weather or equipment or sometimes even awareness uh, i remember having no clue about the 2012 venus transit uh, and with the next transit expected to be in the year 2117 there is a high probability that i will miss it uh but thanks to astrophotography we can record these rare events uh do you think about these rare events and does it bother you if you miss one uh-huh. yeah i think it's uh one issue with astronomy at least is you have this uh, terrible fear of missing out on these beautiful events like uh yeah I, i remember all the way back in 2012 i think i was uh, looking for this uh, venus transit that was a big event it was a transit of venus and uh, venus is a big planet and i think it's not going to happen again in our lifetime but uh, that i remember it was in bangalore i was ready with my camera and my lens and like uh, some sort of solar uh, filter as well and uh, there were clouds there that morning and uh, completely blocked out the view and then you see these really nice images flowing in from other parts of the world and uh, other parts of india as well <laughs> it's really uh, yeah you have this uh, sense of missing out uh, yeah so this is a bit uh, of an interesting phenomenon uh, but yeah you got to take what you get right like um, there have been so many instances for example which i was able to take the uh, be there and experience it and also image it and uh, so you got to be happy with those i guess and uh, yeah not feel too bad about uh, things which you don't see and uh, because things always come around like for example comets every couple of years there will be a nice comet and uh, this neowise for example what you mentioned was completely unexpected it was not uh, you know like uh, expected to be this great comet or something but it was a it in gothenburg and uh, it was really really beautiful to see through a telescope as well and a binoculars as well and uh, even last year's uh, the annular eclipse what we had in india that was incredible to see and uh, photograph as well so but it's a really cool thing and uh, i think it really also a lot of people get interested in this and uh, we have one of these events coming up i think it's uh, next monday the great conjunction of um, jupiter and saturn they'll be super super close together in the sky and if you have a telescope or a pair of binoculars it's going to be a phenomenal view so i'm actually getting ready for that i'm uh, heading to kodaikanal actually to not specifically for that but uh, at least uh, be in a good place to see it with my telescope so yeah i guess you got to take what you get and uh, yeah <laughs> not feel too bad for all the things you don't get but uh, one thing i've realized at least so far is the skies right for at least for me <laughs> for some reason have never been like a disappointing thing the skies will never disappoint somehow sometime like uh, i don't know how like uh, 
it, it opens up and uh, it's usually super, super nice. So, yeah, I guess you got to go there and uh, take the time. And even if you, someone says the weather is going to be bad, you go there and you prepare. And even if it's bad, you, yeah, you take it, but you're at least there. And maybe it opens up for an hour or two or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, there is definitely a luck involved. Uh, but yeah, like you said, we, it is good to try. Uh, one of the key takeaways from your presentation at BMS uh, College, uh, I think this workshop was back in 2016, if I remember correctly, uh, was the possibility of astrophotography with minimum equipment. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk about equipment for beginners? Yeah, I think uh, that's the, the coolest thing I think about uh, astrophotography and even deep sky astrophotography. I mean, you can get into it with relatively uh, inexpensive equipment. And uh, the other side of the spectrum can be vast. It's almost like unbounded. So while the, you get into it relatively cheap, you can to just take a picture of a galaxy or a nebulae. But to get a good photo, like a really, really good photo with all, I mean, uh, all the issues without any issues then it, it i guess it gets more expensive but if you're just looking to start out i think it's possible with just uh, any sort of camera in which you can control the exposure so even phones today for example have been getting super super good and i know in many phones you can control the, the shutter speed for example and you can even image things like the milky way quite well uh, with the phone nowadays and uh, so if you have a camera in which you can control the exposure, the shutter speed, ISO, and uh, the aperture, uh, with this and with something as simple as a tripod or even some kind of homemade stand, uh, you can make, you can image a galaxy and a nebulae. Uh, it's not a very difficult process. It may be time consuming and a lot of manual work, but uh, it is definitely possible. And uh, yeah, so it's, so uh, you just need a camera which you can control the exposure with and a tripod and maybe depends on what type of lens as well you have uh, attached to this camera. Yeah. So it's, it's possible uh, with relatively inexpensive equipment as well. Uh, often with images of nebula and uh, cosmic dust uh, and previously you mentioned about uh, the H alpha spectrum. Uh, they're associated to different colors, but the colors are represented by either the scatter of light or different material composition or gases. Uh, do you see uh, in your images as not just uh, information about the object, but also think about mm -hmm. uh, the material composition uh, or spectroscopy and interaction of light and matter? And do you experiment and learn about those aspects? Uh, so interesting question, like for me particularly, like, uh, I mean, I completely understand like uh, why we have this color and the chemical processes behind that uh, specific color, what we are seeing. But uh, for me, at least, like astrophotography, as I mentioned, is a, a good mixture of an art, a science, and maybe technology. So it's fine for me when you make a picture beautiful. Uh, if you do it in a linear way, you're not doing it in a non-linear way where you sort of manipulate one part of a picture rather than the other part of the picture, that's something I'm not super comfortable with. But uh, when you're doing things in a linear way, I don't mind making a picture more beautiful rather than scientifically perfect. For me, as I mentioned, it's a quite a mix of an art and photography and a technology. So it doesn't have to be scientifically accurate, this picture. No one is going to take my picture and do a <laughs> spectral analysis of it. So I am fine with uh, pushing, uh, for example, like correcting the noise in an image uh, to make it more clean in some ways. Or, uh, yeah, so these kind of things uh, to make a picture, in my view, more beautiful. So 
but it's not something i actively think about it's definitely fascinating like uh, especially when you're imaging um different objects for example like nebulae is definitely one thing but uh, when you're doing comets for example like the colors of the comets always fascinate me a lot like even neo wise and compared to like if you look at the comets we've had in the past like comet lovejoy in 2014 which was green and it was absolutely beautiful to look at and uh, um yeah so it's really interesting the composition of color and uh, the chemical and physical processes which make way for that but uh, it's not something i pay active you know attention to uh, it's something i would like to maybe in the past in the future but uh, it's not something i actively do Uh, speaking of noise, a friend of mine wants to know how you post-process long exposure images, and if you use a mix of black and white and color images and combine them in some way to produce your astrophotography pictures. Yeah, so I mean, I don't do this LRGB kind of photography where you have a monochrome camera. uh that is a specific type of photography people do where you have a camera which records only one wavelength or a certain types of wavelength certain uh, bandwidth of wavelength and uh, you use these specific kind of filters like a rgb filter like a specific red filter take in data take with green and blue and also with a luminance filter and you combine them all together to get a proper color image later uh, that's something i have not done at all uh i shoot with a one shot color kind of camera where you have one camera capturing the entire visual and a little bit more from the visual spectrum so it's not something i actively do uh, the second part of your question but uh, the first part like how do i handle the noise this is some a very interesting topic to me because you definitely need to have some sort of noise reduction process in your entire workflow uh, you need to probably start with a camera which is little less noisy and maybe uh, for example for my camera i have a cooler a peltier cooler attached to the sensor in some way and which further reduces the noise of long exposure images but then after that when you're into post processing you need to first have a very large amount of data so the larger your data stack you have uh you can also during the stack the noise reduces quite a bit so for example if you have just five images compared to if you have 100 images of the same object of same shutter speed and aperture and things like that uh the 100 stack will look a lot less noisier than your five stack so that's something as well which is super super good to do and also when you're looking at specific tools for processing i use this uh, incredible post processing tool astrophotography tool called uh, pixinsight and it has a lot of uh, noise reduction tools with really good noise reduction algorithms uh, which really help and i can talk about that for quite some time but i guess uh, it will take some time yep yeah. uh, moving on to microbiology uh, and uh, photo microscopy uh, we covered the large worlds of the cosmos and i think to be nice to explore the much smaller world that often uh, not visible to the naked eye uh, can you tell tell us how you got started with photo micrography and how you relate uh, the small world to the big uh... yeah for me it started when uh, i was in sweden and uh, <laughs> it was super cloudy uh, and as i mentioned before like astronomy at astrophotography at the level which i was doing in india was not possible in living in gothenburg so i needed to definitely i thought to niche out to something else and uh, this is something which has been at least i've been looking at for quite some time these uh, images of really really tiny things i've never i mean i had biology in school but i think it was 
I think 10th grade when I last had biology. And uh, it, I, I, I looked through the microscope at least when I was in school and it was really fascinating at least at that time. But uh, I had never really got into the photography aspect of it, but it always was quite fascinating. And uh, so when this astrophotography was not really possible, I thought, why not? Let me start reading up uh, quite a bit about it. So again, I started reading up a lot and uh, looking at these incredible images which people take in different ways and uh, slowly was able to manage to get a, quite a used microscope. It was an Olympus BH2 from the 80s and uh, it's super, super nice. And uh, I, was, I just used to collect uh, some pond water. So, you know, like if you have a small lake, I have a small lake where I live and uh, I just took a sample of that water and just observing that under a microscope is you see a whole world of life. There is so much of movement, so many tiny things which are going up and down like living and uh, it's absolutely amazing to look at them through a microscope uh, and uh, photographing them too is quite challenging. There is similar to astrophotography, there is a nice learning curve to master and to do and i'm still in that process very much and it's uh, it's quite a phenomenal world as well as deep and detailed and beautiful the cosmos is the bigger cosmos it's incredibly beautiful on the other side as well you have these tiny things which are so intricate so beautiful so complex and uh, it's so fascinating to see them and photograph them as well. So yeah, it's, uh, it's something not too old for me. I just started this about a nine months or 10 months back. So it's something which is still ongoing and trying to see how I can do it well. Has your perspective of everyday objects and interactions changed after extensively observing microscopic organisms yeah like uh, if you're one of these uh, clean or neat freaks right it's going to be a bad time to do astrophoto <laughs> i mean photo micrography because uh, everything right like you just take a swab of something in your table or the water you drink normally and things like that there is a lot of stuff going on there so our bodies are incredibly capable things which can handle this uh, and these normal microorganisms, but uh, it can be a bit scary, I guess, for certain people uh, to look at that and uh, continue to live their lives in the same way. So, but uh, yeah, it's also good for me, like I'm quite aware now that there is this <laughs> micro cosmos all around me, uh, which, uh, Unfortunately, we don't pay too much attention to, and uh, I guess it becomes too much of a constraint if people do, but yeah, something to think about. Yes, yeah. it's, it's in a way uh, like the overview effect, uh, but at a different scale. Yeah. Uh, there are some common questions uh, that I asked my guests. Uh, so what are you currently working on? You talked about your uh, adventure to a correct canal. Uh, are there anything else that you're mm -hmm. working on? Like for me right now, I'm quite happy. Like apart from doing all this, I'm already I, I work as well. So it's it's been super fun. Uh, what I'm doing, I mean, what I do at work as well. So that's uh, been taking a bit of time from my <laughs> regular activities. So now that I finally have my vacation as well, I'm really hoping to do a lot more, uh, you know, time things which I can spend a, an extended period of time on. And uh, analog photography to me right now is uh, really hitting that spot quite nicely. Uh, and I really hope to take a lot more analog photos uh, the next couple of uh, months. And hopefully when I, I'm, I'm planning to go back to Sweden in the middle of uh, January to start, I have all my processing equipment back there. So process all the photos I've taken so far on this trip as well. And uh, 
Yeah, apart from that, uh, I don't know. I'm getting more a lot into cycling nowadays. That's something, uh, I mean, I've, I've been doing it for the last two years, but uh, it's something very interesting as well. And uh, it's good to explore that side as, of the, you know, it's, it's more to do with your body in certain ways than your mind. And that's also quite interesting. And uh, yeah, just uh, relax and have a good time, especially in Pratikanal, like uh, it's something I'm really looking forward to. Uh, I really like this concept of uh, organic farming as well. I really hope to, uh, the place where I'm going to right now, there is a organic farm in some way. So to experience some life there and see how things are done and how we can be a little bit more sustainable in the way we do things. So. Uh, something I'm really looking forward to as well. Can you name some the books that you value? I think you mentioned Art of Seeing, if I remember earlier. Yeah. Are there any other books yeah. that you would like to mention? Yeah, I really like uh, Cosmos. That's something which I'm uh, a big fan of. And uh, yeah, like I think if you want a good uh, uh, history of everything i mean like a, not history i would say like a good very nice way to describe the universe i think that's the perfect book to get you started and uh, yeah like uh, there are a lot i mean uh, i'm in all these kind of things i am a bit religious as well so for me personally i really like the book the bible like uh, i think for me that's uh, it's it intertwines a lot with uh, the things I do with uh, science and technology and things like that. So that as well is to me a, a very solid book. And uh, yeah, even if people who are not religious, I think it's definitely an interesting read. And uh, yeah, so these, I mean, I'm not a very avid reader. It's not something I'm, I do a lot. <laughs> and, uh, but these are some of the books uh, and quite a lot more as well, which have reflected and changed some parts of my life. Maybe a bit uh, philosophical, but uh, what are some values in life that are important to you? Yeah, I mean, the most, uh, I think, uh, important is, I don't know, be kind to everybody. Just uh, don't be a dick in some ways. Like, uh, just be happy and uh, find a way to make uh, the people around you happy. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it, if you want to go ahead and use this term love, I think that's, uh, it en encompasses a lot of these things. And it's always good to love all the people you're with, your, uh, the people you interact and the people you don't interact. So. Yeah, I think that covers a lot of the things in many ways. And I don't mean it like in this uh, relationship sort of thing, but just as, I mean, it can be expressed in a lot of different ways. And yeah, so just be happy, be kind and help others be happy and kind. That's the most, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, for me at least. Uh, I'm not a very deep, <laughs> you know, this philosophical who thinks about uh, uh, yeah, the, I mean, I, I definitely love thinking about that, but uh, I usually just, I'm, I'm at least at this point in my life, I'm more doing the learning right now. I don't have, I don't, I don't, I, I feel I don't have uh, enough experience to give a philosophical answer on, yeah, value yet. <laughs> Uh, where can people find out more about you and your work? How can they connect to you online? Yeah, I think best is Instagram. So you can just follow me on Johan Nishant. Uh, it's one big word on Instagram. I think uh, that's where at least I post most of the things, uh, what I do. So yeah, that's the best way. Uh, this has definitely been one of the highlights of 2020 for me. Uh, I've been following your work since a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. And I hope you didn't mind answering some of some deep questions. I often no, get carried away. It's <laughs> no, it's been pretty nice. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, so thank you for taking time to speak with me. This was really interesting and fun. Yeah, thank you as well. <laughs>